I want to this morning continue, complete, I hope, our, our discussion of uh, iterability and then go on to certain aspects of the uncanny essay of Freud. And then in the afternoon, look at uh, 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 the uh, section from Zarathustra that's been distributed, uh, which, as you'll, you'll see, in a certain way that links up with many of the issues that we've been discussing. Uh, and then uh, at the very end, show a few film clips from this film, All the Mornings of the Wor in the World, uh, which is what doesn't, uh, it doesn't relate, it relates also to, to the question of repetition and in connection also with music and history. Um, also, again, I want to urge you, this is our you know, last day together. Uh, by all means, feel free to uh, discuss, basically, to, to bring in any questions that accumulate. I try to, <coughs> as much as possible, to uh, uh, back up and uh, reduce the amount of, uh, of prerequisites to a minimum, but I realize, for example, in discussing the Derrida, how much I presuppose about that. I've been working on this stuff for so long, and uh, many of you, you know, may or may not have, have worked on it. So, for example, one of the one of the things to to uh, uh, to be keep in mind is how important for him, uh, in a sort of negative way, this idea of presence and self presence is. That's very massive in the early writings, and particularly in in the grammatology. And in fact, his whole initial strategy of trying to problematize the relation of writing to speech. Uh, speech has to do with the question of, of uh, the possibility of presence and self-presence, which uh, in a certain tradition is associated with speech and is used in order to, to subordinate writing, which Im implies the absence of spirit uh, it, for a certain perspective, uh, to speech, which implies a kind of living, creative word, and so on. And th this is a, a scheme that he tries to problematize. Uh, throughout, and what we're reading here is one aspect of that of that problematization. Um, it, if you if you read carefully the discussion already that that, he, that we went over with Searle, you'll see one of the major I think mistakes in in uh, in reading Derrida often is that he was making statements about writing and speech per se. He was never making statements about writing and speech per se. Uh, because I don't, according to his perspective, there is no such thing as writing and speech per se. There, there are uh, interpretations of writing and speech, and there are certain traits of writing and speech, but they can't be separated uh, from the way they're interpreted. So, in other words, uh, he once told me that he could have uh, he could have developed similar arguments, somewhat similar arguments to what he was doing, inversing the hierarchy. In other words, trying to show how speech is, uh, is necessarily implies absence, and writing uh, has often been valorized a certain kind of presence, permanence, and so on and so forth. Uh, and if he didn't do it, this he didn't say, but I assume if he didn't do this, it was because uh, Derrida was always aware in a kind of Nietzschean sense, but even in a, in a more than Nietzschean sense in a certain way, that uh, uh, every act of writing, every so-called speech act, is an intervention in a prevailing relation of state of forces, in a power system. And that what he was doing was trying to identify the strong and weak points of the prevailing conventional uh, dominant dominant view, if you could say. Uh, and that's what led him to develop the arguments that he develops in the grammatology and, and, and elsewhere. So, so that is, if you will, the sort of the deconstructive uh, point of departure, which is to say, what are, uh, as historical beings, we're always functioning within specific constructs. But these constructs tend to take themselves as either ontologically or naturally given. This is something that Nietzsche actually describes. Nietzsche says that when a, when a, a certain interpretive perspective uh, seeks to triumph over competing perspectives, the way it does this is either to naturalize itself or to ontologize itself. In other words, to say that what it, its view of the world is not a particular uh, 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 view, but it's, it's the nature of being, i.e. ontology, the logos of being, or its nature 
per se, you see. Um, so, uh, and that this is a sign of a, of a sort of triumphant, but also a deceptive uh, interpretive, interpretive stance. So in the grammatology, then, for instance, that's why, he, that's why the title of it was de la grammatologie, of grammatology. He was never constructing a system of grammatology per se, because that would have been very much counter to his whole approach. Uh, which is that they're, 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 that you only have, a, in a certain sense, relation of relations of forces and so on. Um, so when he speaks of writing and speech, if you read carefully, just as when he speaks of iteration, iterability, he's not speaking simply of facts, but he's, he's, he's speaking of interpretations of facts that are hierarchical and that are uh, informed by a certain set of values which he takes, and the most important value that he therefore problematizes is that of being present to oneself, however complicated that is to think about. A, a form of self-identity, you see. That is what's uh, uh, the highest value, and from that point, in terms of a certain Western system of philosophy, metaphysics, but I, I, uh, I think you, what one has to add to that is that this Western system of, of philosophy and metaphysics uh, goes hand in hand with a certain level of common sense up to a point. You know, uh, so it both reflects and, and imposes itself on, you, you don't have to be, in other words, a philosopher to, to be, uh, uh, how to say, to have your worldview informed by a notion of reality as self-presence, you see. So, uh, and one can say that what philosophy does is to articulate that at a very high level, conceptual level, but it doesn't in, neither invents it nor is it alone in, 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 in advocating that. So that's why he's, I think he always felt that to challenge a certain, meta, what he calls a metaphysics of presence, he calls, of course, a logocentrism, phonologocentrism, a whole bunch of different <coughs> words th that he uses, is to challenge a system whose authority uh, is not limited just to prat practitioners of philosophy, but that reflects at the same time a hierarchy of values that dominates many, many, you know, social and political, economic uh, 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 activities and institutions and structures. So, I mean, for him, therefore, deconstruction really involved try trying to intervene in uh, a power relations that structure a world. So it's both very, very ambitious. At the same time, I, I don't think he had any illusions about it being, you know, uh, uh, nevertheless, a, a modest, a modest uh, uh, proposal in a certain sense. Uh, 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 because uh, of precisely the, the nature of power, power relations and so on. But it's also what, yeah, please. No, there's this, I, I always read Derrida like it was, there was no ontology that would ever be su su adequate for him, that, there, that the, the simple act of making an ontology is automatically falsifiable. So no. is that true? Is there no ontology for him? Well, falsif uh, 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 it depends what one means by falsifiable. I guess it's sort of, um, uh, you know, absolutist. No, yeah, I mean, I think that's. I think that is true. I think that. It, I think that is. The, uh, I think that's true. Uh, but the demonstration of its inadequacy for Derrida, uh, and this is what distinguishes him, I believe, from a lot of philosophers or theoreticians, and what brings him a little bit closer to literary people, uh, always has to take place in, in in the confrontation with singular configurations. In other words, singular specific configurations. It's not a question of creating an anti-system or showing that a system in general. That's why uh, a, a high percentage of his writings involve the reading of texts. Because the reading of texts, uh, it's not that it's written as opposed to uh, living reality, that will be the, the kind of hierarchy he's trying to deconstruct, but it's, it has to do with singular configurations. In other words, it, in other, I think the, the strategy behind that is that something like an ontology uh, necessarily has to subordinate the singular to the universal. The singular is seen then as an instantiation or example of a universal. Therefore, the real battle goes on at the level of concepts and universalities, if you will. You see. For De Derrida, precise, that's precisely what he is calling into, in, in, into question. For him, the real battle goes on always at the level of the relation of the singular to the universal. And in order, that's why, for example, many of his writings are occasional. Uh, well, uh, they 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 uh, include the occasionality that calls forth the the essay. Let's say he's invited to give a paper at a conference and so on. 
And uh, 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 that's not just for him a you know, kind of practical necessity, but it also allows him to problematize the relation between the singular and the, uh, the putatively, ostensibly universal that tries to subordinate, you know, subordinate it, that would try to subordinate it. And, this, and ultimately, uh, this seems to me to challenge the, the traditional notion of what, how meaning works. Because meaning, and meaning, as I mentioned yesterday, always involves true meaning, more or less, uh, um, uh, intelligent meaning, as the translators uh, had it, um, implies universe, a certain universality, you see. And that's why it's both attractive but also suspicious. It's attractive because if you extract meaning from a singular event, text, uh, 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 incident, it's as if you can then rest, you can, you can relax with it, and you have a certain control because it applies not just, it both puts the event in its place and allows you a certain idea of being able to control the, the uncertain future. Uh, insofar as that meaning, at least, will remain self-identical, you see. Like a laboratory experiment, I see a kind of parallel, <coughs> parallel there. But uh, the meanings that Derrida extracts from a kind of deconstructive reading of text or deconstruction of, of, of the relation of the singular to the... never can be, can be uh, uh, expected to stay the same, in, t entirely the same, through its iterations, through other, other incidents. So that's why... There are very, very few terms and categories that stay the same in his writing. There's a con in other words, evolution, not necessarily progress, but evolution is constantly programmed in uh, and, uh, and, 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 and in a way excludes a priori an absolutely stable vocabulary or terminology, as opposed to a systematic thinker who would try to set up certain concepts that would uh, enable him or her to then you know, subordinate, understand, uh, 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 singular, all kinds of singular events. See, so this is where you can see the notion of repetition is important. His um, his whole process procedure tries to allow for account, uh, leave place for repetition as a process of transformation rather than uh, uh, a simp the simple reproduction of the same. You see, now that that brings him closer to uh, art, art and literature than to what is odd, often thought of as cognitive science or something like that. In the sense that cognitive science, you, you, you come up with a meaning and a result, and it's supposed to then, under certain conditions, stay the same, no matter where you apply it. Whereas in literature and art, I think you know, the, the idea of each singular uh, experience transforming, to some extent, what goes on, is, is much more familiar. For example, if you, uh, uh, a good reading, an interesting reading of Hamlet is not one that puts Hamlet you know, to, to bed, as it were. You've got the meaning of Hamlet, so you don't really have, but it enables you to go back to Hamlet and see other connections think, on the basis of, so that it's precisely what then, in a certain sense, escapes, both interacts with and escapes with a certain interpretation in order to produce new, new relations that makes a reading interesting. That, that's the way I would say. So that's, this, is a, see, this is why the, sort of the cognitive element in, uh, let's say, a literary reading or I think an artistic uh, interpretation um, doesn't have the same, often the same value for many uh, people that uh, cognition in other areas has because the, the sort of the implicit valorization of cognition is that it be able to stay the same over time, that it be able, gives you a certain power of controlling the future as un uncertainty, whereas precisely a cognition that, that sensitizes you to the future as, uh, as change uh, is, doesn't give you that power. It, it, it opens you to uh, new experiences, to transformations, yeah. Um, I guess, the, and I, 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 I follow, um, but the problem for me arises when you sort of compare uh, Derrida to Baudrillard uh, because you end up to who? I'm sorry. Baudrillard. Baudrillard. Baudrillard yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, you end up in a place um, <clears throat> where signs are no longer linked to specific events. Signs are now sort of they're widespread. There's no longer a proper name or a proper noun. Right. It's now so basically the entire language that Derrida uses um, as his deconstruction becomes uh, sort of it is wrapped up in its own sort of ontology because each word that he's using is in its own right a universal. Although he's sort of um, he's pushing the universal aside and saying, no, 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 you know, we need to get you know, to the singular event of his text. Yeah. The words that he's using are already universal. Yeah, but that's why uh, it takes me again back to that, that this mode of thinking requires the encounter with another discourse. 
<coughs> with, or with another configuration. It doesn't, it requires it, it, it needs that, it's looking for that, it, it, it need, but precisely in order that it not be caught in a kind of entropy of repeating the same thing over and over again. And in fact, if you, you, know, if you look through the, the, the history of his writings, you do see a, you know, a, a fundamental shift, not necessarily in the sort of the basic anti-ontological, uh, but in the way in which the, the, the emphases that are, that are put. For example, his, the lectures of the last 10 years or so uh, dealt with things like hospitality, uh, uh, death penalty, uh, anim, you know, the question of the animal, uh, uh, etc. And in all of those cases, what, what was happening was he was responding to, to two rough imperatives. On the one hand, the work he had done before, uh, which necessarily pushes him to do something else, but not totally unrelated. And the second thing is the impulses that came from without. So, uh, and that was conditional on his singular situation. As he became more and more known, he was, uh, you know, uh, uh, put in situations that he otherwise would not have been in. For example, uh, with South Africa, Mandela, and so on. He was, and uh, so he, was, in, in a way, his work became more and more manifestly political, you could sort of say, dealing more, and, in, and in, in a certain sense also dealing with questions that would be considered ethical questions. But, his, uh, there, uh, but there is a very tricky, tricky business because traditional ethics uh, uh, falls under the category of something like ontology, in the sense, not exactly, but so, because it, it, it tries to develop general principles to guide your action in specific cases, you see. And uh, with Kant, there's a real break there because Kant wants it both ways but refuses to collapse the two so that the, a Kantian ethics uh, sets up what he calls maxims, like the categorical imperative, treat others never other human, as, as ends, never as means, but insists that you can never know in a singular case if you're in fact doing that, you see. So there's a kind of break there in the and uh, so ethics after Kant, and this is very the tradition in which I think he, he Derrida would situate himself, uh, uh, is not trying to set up uh, general principles that establish a continuum and and tell you how to behave in specific situations, but rather general principles that allow you to take into account the inability of general principles to subordinate the singular in each, in each and every case. And his term for that is responsibility. And I would, uh, my own reading of that, although uh, uh, um, the problem there is that he, he didn't publish that much. Some of it, they're scattered about. Not, there's no one book, let's say, that deals on, but he, uh, so that you'd have to go and read his lectures, some of which I heard, other which I didn't. So I'm not sure that I have access to everything that he did on that. But as I understand what he's doing, or read it, I would translate it into English as responsiveness. A heightened response, in other words, an ethics of responsiveness. And by, by which I mean, in other words, that you, the, the, the general expectations that one inevitably has and can't ever do away with, it's not like you go into the future of the tabula rasa, uh, would be sufficiently flexible and, 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 and uh, so that to allow you to, to, to be open to, the, to, to things that resist and challenge them. Something resists your understanding, you don't react necessarily with hostility or with a sense of, I've got to get that under control by assimilating it, but you allow yourself to investigate uh, and you suspend a certain kind of, uh, you know, judgment, judgmental. Uh, this is my, my, this is not Derrida. This is the way I understand the, uh, the way I can make sense of what I've read of, of that. But um, in any case, he was, you know, he's put in a position, very interesting, of what Lacan calls the, the sujet supposé savoir. He became, you know, a very controversial figure, but also one that a lot of people came to expecting answers on everything. And, you know, uh, he was a very smart man, but I think he knew very well. He, could, he wasn't a specialist in every area and didn't have answers to everything, and nevertheless was called upon to, you know, address increasingly sort of uh, uh, felt himself called on uh, to address general issues that weren't just philosophical issues. So he tries to do that in a way which uh, upsets 
the uh, some of the the, uh, the the frameworks that either traditional ontology or ethics use in order to subordinate the singular to the to the uh, general. And I'll give you an example of that uh, coming from Nietzsche, which is very important for him. And this is uh, from the uh, uh, this is from chapter this is from uh, Beyond Good and Evil, Chapter One, called Prejudices of Philosophers, and it's numbered it's numbered so it's number two. It's a sort of a paragraph which I, I think I can read. Uh, uh, I think it's quite important. He starts out with a quote. Nietzsche, how could anything originate out of its opposite? For example, truth out of error, or the will to truth out of the will to deception, or the generous deed out of selfishness, or the pure sunbright vision of the wise man out of covetousness. Such genesis is impossible. Whoever dreams of it is a fool, nay, worse than a fool. Things of the highest value must have a different origin an origin of their own. This is Nietzsche summarizing an attitude that he's going to go on to criticize. In this transitory, seductive, illusory, paltry world, in this turmoil of delusion and cupidity, they cannot have their source. This is, you know, the usual, the, the, his sort of ultimate gripe with Platonism, that you have two worlds, a world of ideas, a world of the good, of the true, and then you have the world of sort of the basically uh, uh, of, of uh, empirical mortal beings and so on. And uh, uh, so they, they, they can't have their source in this transitory, seductive, illusory, paltry world, but rather in the lap of being, in the intransitory, in the concealed God, in the thing in itself. There must be their source and nowhere else. That's all in quotes. So by putting it in quotes, Nietzsche is setting himself off from what he's just describing here. And he goes on then, he says, this mode of reasoning discloses the typical prejudice by which metaphysicians of all times can be recognized. This mode of valuation is at behind all of their logical procedure. Through this belief of theirs, they exert themselves for their knowledge, for something that is in the end solemnly <laughs> christened the truth. The fundamental belief of metaphysicians is the belief in antitheses of values. It never occurred even to the wariest of them to doubt here on the very threshold where doubt, however, was most necessary, though they had made a solemn vow, the omnibus dubitandum, of everything should be doubted. For it may be doubted, firstly, whether antitheses exist at all, and secondly, whether the popular valuations and antitheses of value upon which metaphysicians have set their, go their seal are not perhaps merely superficial estimates, merely provisional perspectives, besides being probably made from some corner, perhaps from below, fraud perspectives, as it were, to borrow an expression current among painters. In spite of all the value which may belong to the true, the positive, and the unselfish, it might be possible that a higher and more fundamental value for life generally should be assigned to pretense, to the will to delusion, to selfishness, and cupidity. It might even be possible that what constitutes the value of those good and respected things consists precisely in their being, and this is very important for Derrida, I think, insidiously related, knotted, note that term, and uh, crocheted, Cro crocheted, Cro crocheted, yeah, crocheted, yeah. crocheted, crocheted, I think, yeah, yeah. It's crocheted, to these evil and apparently opposed things, perhaps even in being essentially identical with them, perhaps, but who wishes to concern himself with such dangerous perhapses? For that investigation, one must await the advent of a new order of philosophers such as will have other tastes and inclinations, the reverse of those hitherto prevalent, philosophers of the dangerous perhaps in every sense of the term. And to speak in all seriousness, I see such new philosophers beginning to appear. Uh, now, this I think is really prophetic in lots of ways, and it, it also fits to a large extent uh, the project of, of, of Derrida. In other words, from very early on, 
in the grammatolo of grammatology, he makes the argument that what Nietzsche here is calling antitheses, or oppositions, actually, Gagin Zetzen, is not just a, 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 a logical means to identify a thing, but it's always a means to subordinate one thing to something else. In other words, if you take the founding, you know, oppositions, mind, body, etc., uh, appearance, reality, you'll find that they always go together with a valorization. And so it's a, it, 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 for Nietzsche, that's an in indication of a relation of power and not simply a relation of being, if you will, of, or of neutral, of neutral recognition. And the, the valorization then uh, uh, presupposes uh, that uh, these, the, the two aspects of an antithesis or opposition are mutually exclusive in their essence and in their practice and that uh, they have therefore separate origins and that they can be separated and therefore in, uh, in a double sense hierarchized. Uh, so, um, well, I just lost this thing. Um, uh, so, for example, this is this is something that he makes quite clear in 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 uh, uh, his discussion then of uh, writing and and speech. That this what he's attacking is a certain ontology that has uh, conceived these two as, in some sense, oppositional, separate, and valorizing. Uh, the one over the other in the name of a value of identity as self, as um, self-presence. Uh, another aspect that comes up, particularly in a book of Derrida's uh, called Politics of Friendship, is that the, 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 the nature, once you problematize the um, relation of antitheses in this way, once you no longer base cognition on uh, this sort of separation of opposites, the nature of cognition changes, and it can no longer uh, it can no longer uh, claim the kind of infallible universality as the criterion of truth, and that's where what uh, this idea of perhaps comes in and dangerous perhaps. Uh, Derrida has a whole section of, in, in, interesting enough, in the context of politics of friendship, on this question of the perhaps. And, uh, and Nietzsche, if you notice in the second part of this section, also uses the word perhaps, perhaps and then he makes a series of, 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 of statements. So the, the perhaps there is a way of trying to take into account that any cognitive statement, judgment, uh, 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 um, predication, um, uh, and so on, um, is, uh, can never be self-contained, can never claim to be, uh, to be validated or invalidated absolutely but always has to leave itself open to something else happening. And Derrida at one point says that he prefers the English word perhaps to the uh, French word that he's using, which is peut-être. And he says the reason is that the peut-être, the, the can be, per, per, uh, suggests that it might, that, that, the, that the, perhaps the, the contingency that's being acknowledged there could be subordinated to a power to a, the, the power of doing something, whereas the perhaps uh, 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 um, acknowledges a kind of happenstance, a happening that isn't necessarily under the control of a power. See, I mean, it's a different way of dealing with, with singular contingencies um, uh, 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 there. And so one of the... Uh, and why is this dangerous? And here's where we come, I think, to the questions that are close to the, uh, the uncanny and so on. Um, uh, it depends how one defines danger, but uh, uh, my, my sense of that is very much influenced by this text of Freud that I cited uh, yesterday, which is Inhibition, Symptoms, and Anxiety, where he says that anxiety is the reaction of the ego to a perceived danger. See? And he says, what is the danger there? And the danger is always, is never absolute. A danger is a danger to something, someone, and in this case, a danger to a particularly organized system, which is that of the ego, which is that of, uh, uh, and which in our culture, at least, um, expects a certain type of imminence, uh, organization, control, uh, self-identity, presence, and so on. <clears throat> Anything that is perceived as, 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 as possibly threatening that is, is perceived to be a danger and produces various uh, responses. One of them is anxiety. 
Another one that Freud doesn't really talk about that, but that we saw, for example, in the uh, in this Hoffman story yesterday, and that's related to anxiety is aggression, and that for me is a, provides it for me a very very useful way to look at at, at contemporary politics. You see, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, uh, as I think it may, is manifest with the war against terror is the war uh, both against a certain panic anxiety and the, call, the, the, the ostensible cause of that anxiety. And the way that ostensible cause is then determined um, you know, is very significant. Uh, for example, as essentially an outside cause, essentially a, a military threat, so that things that then happen, such as the, the Gulf of Mexico, this is, you know, that, that, that may really affect the lives of many more people even than the, the, bo the bombings of the World Trade Center, or lots of other such uh, you know, uh, events are not treated quite in the same way, although um, unless I'm very severely mistaken, I think there is a kind of a real fundamental unease uh, uh, created by this catastrophe. In the, and uh, I saw it once described by somebody I don't like at all, but for once I must say I was happy that I read his column, David Brooks, mm. in, the, in, the New York, in the New York Times the other day, just a few days ago, uh, said that the reason why this is so uh, frightening and, 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 and why people are so at ease is that it shakes the belief in the omnipotence of human technology to solve all problems. You know, Now, we already had that with, I, I've had that for a long time with atomic energy, it seems to me. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, in various ways, whether uh, uh, military or in peaceful terms, you know, disp disposing of, of, of nuclear waste, which is, a, as far as I know, still a totally unresolved you know, problem, uh, and, and you know, one of the one of the theories was to bury it deep in the ocean. And that was a member one. I don't know if that's been you know uh, 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 abandoned, but uh, I find that uh, remark of, of David Brooks very very pertinent, very accurate. But it fits in very well with this whole situation where technology is developed uh, very closely in connection with military purposes. I mean, throughout all of Western history and, and today probably more than ever as a way of combating anxiety uh, through technological control, either directly militarily or indirectly through the technologies that are developed that aren't necessarily directly military, you know, uh, uh, military. They have all kinds of civilian uh, uses, but that uh, the connection there between uh, uh, technology uh, and uh, anxiety uh, seems to me uh, uh, important, although the power of technology is such that this connection is able to be really marginalized, except in certain literary and, and, and exceptional cases, you know, where it's, and literature is full of it. You know, but then it's said, well, this is romanticism, you know, the romantics are anti-technological or something like that, which is only partially true. I mean, uh, 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 but you know, you see, do see it in the story, and then there's a lot of uh, there are a lot of where the technology that that uh, the basic the basic ambivalence of technology is that it is it lies in its prosthetic function with respect to the finite bodily existence of of human beings, and that's what you, in other words, because the eyes can't see everything, you developed you know all kinds of visual things in order to supplement and so on. But the more you rely on the technology, in a way, the more vulnerable you become. Uh, there's that sense. Or the more you acknowledge your vulnerability in a certain sense, or your limitations as, uh, and so on. And that's some of the things that we see going on in that, you know, in that, uh, uh, in that story, in, in the story yesterday, but also uh, very much, very much today. That's why, so that, you know, you have no problem uh, 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 approving, you know, regularly enormous budgets to continue the war in Afghanistan, to continue the war in Iraq. But for example, you, you know, very small amounts of money that would be necessary to extend uh, health benefits to the unemployed, you know, falls under what is called the, the, uh, the necessity of debt, debt reduction. And so you have a total kind of schizophrenic type of, of you know, of, of thinking, which is, uh, so if you, you know, if you ask yourself, uh, how is it possible that in a certain sense, such obvious things that should be obvious uh, can be can enjoy such a broad consensus. Uh, you know, it's not enough just to talk. The, the, the media, of course, uh, which are closely related to all of this, 
uh, play their role, but they wouldn't be listened to if the media weren't able to, you know, speak to very basic mindsets and attitudes that we're trying to, you know, sort of, I think, uh, you know, I'm trying to sort of speak to here, which is that people are, you know, and um, so part of that has to do with uh, the relationship between, which is, by the way, unfortunately, really gummed up in the uh, English translation of the Freud, uh, uh, between what is it, it, between anxiety and fear. You have two different words for that, and the unfortunate thing is that in English, the word anxiety doesn't, isn't quite used in the same way, but Freud, uh, the, the, what Freud is talking about in connection with the uncanny is very often mo mo mostly anxiety and not fear, and it's always translated as fear. And the problem with that is that's, that's, that really gives away the whole problem in a certain sense, because anxiety is something that is non-objective. It's expecting something but doesn't know what. It's reacting to an anticipated danger. Once you have fear, you've already objective, you've already found an object, a face usually, or a figure, to attach it to, and that makes you in a way less afraid because then you can uh, think at least you can control it. Ultimately, it allows you to think in terms of a quasi-military solution. If you can locate it, if you can name it, if you can find the residence of Adradek, you can control it, so you can destroy it, or at least encapsulate it and so on. But, and that's why in, for example, uh, lots and lots and lots of uh, Hollywood uh, movies exploiting anxiety. I always think of uh, Alien 1, for example, where you, know, where you have these scenes of creating anxiety. The way it's done is you have a, a close-up of Sigourney Weaver, uh, you know, and she's looking out of the frame, or she's running from something, you know, and the closer, the more you have a close-up, the more you're limited to what her immediate physical sort of presence there. And you can't see what's going on outside there, you see. And this, this is the difference between fear and anxiety. If you say, the anxiety is what you can't see. But what you want, if possible, to, uh, uh, you know, to, to tie to a face uh, and body and so on, so that you then can uh, defend against it more, you know, more, more, more easily in some sense. Uh, yeah, so I'm just taking us a bit... Uh, uh, but, but the... the uh, uh, I think this is also connected to this value of self-presence that underlies a lot of what uh, Derrida is trying to, to, to do. He, what he, what, the basic argument of Derrida with respect to antithesis, and, which, which, which elaborates on what we just read in Nietzsche here, is that thinking in terms of antitheses and oppositions allows you to take the necessary relation of identity and otherness, or self and difference, and so on, and subordinate the other and the different to the same by creating a hierarchy. You see, you must acknowledge some other. You can't think good without evil, let's say. You can't think mind, or it's very difficult, or appearance without reality or something. But everything depends how you then think those relationships. and what. Thinking in terms of mutually exclusive oppositions, that's what I think is important with antithesis, allows you to say, well, whatever is different and other is a subset of what's the same. Identity comes first, difference comes second. Different is the external surrounding that allows you to identify the, the same as internal, as self, uh, uh, you know, as self consistent. That's why the, in, the, in the argument that he's making, he puts so much emphasis on the fact that the fact that something seems to be marginal you know, should not allow one to not consider it a necessary part of a structure. You see. On the contrary, and this is an argument, by the way, that goes back to Kierkegaard, again, re repetition, and that's also picked up by Carl Schmitt in a political sense, in a different way. The exception is essential for the constitution of the rule of the non-exception. It isn't something that is just accessory, you see. Uh, and uh, uh, this is also, this is a little bit the way deconstruction works. The exception literally is that which is taken outward, cut, you know, which is put outside to allow a certain inside, whether you think of this visually, pictorially, conceptually, to constitute itself. And the question is, what is the relation of that outside to the inside, you see? And this this adage says it's 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 constitutive, you know, it's but that's paradoxical because you can never 
include the outside, quay outside, and then he focused on it. You can include part of it, and that's what a deconstruction uh, element will do, but you can never include the outside per se. You can try to keep yourself open to what goes on on the periphery. Um, for those of you who are interested in visual things, there's a, uh, a book that would have probably gone unnoticed had not Liu Ta uh, somehow discovered it. I'm not sure how, uh, there was a French translation of it. This is an Austrian uh, book by, uh, two books actually, by an Austrian who had been in uh, Viennese, who had emigrated in the 30s to, 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 to London, and who hung out there with the in psychoanalysis, but he was a draftsman and, a, 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 and taught in, in design schools actually, and also taught drawing at various levels uh, in, in London, also with children. Uh, his name was Anton Ehrenzweig. Did anybody ever hear of him? Is that good that I mention it? E-H-R-E-N-Z-W-E-I-G. Uh, huh? -E -E Anton. And he wrote two books. He died fairly young, unfortunately, I think in the mid-60s. And one is called A Psychoanalytic Theory of Vision, I believe, and the, uh, roughly. And the other is called uh, The Hidden Order of Art. And what he tried to do there was to develop at the, level, at the level of pictorial representation, using his experience with children and so on, uh, in part, a theory of representation that would correspond and do justice to what he felt was the, Freud, the Freudian theory of the conscious and the unconscious, as expressed in the Freudian categories of... of, of uh, of what? Of uh, primary and secondary process. That'll be blank for me. Primary and secondary process. Freud talks about this in the interpretation of dreams and elsewhere. The primary process, which is, uh, is when uh, your relationship to the outside world and the thinking is determined largely by the pleasure principle, by drives and instincts. So it, it's stronger in younger children than in older and so on. And the secondary process is more what we think of as our usual, our usual way of thinking. And the difference is that in the primary process, uh, uh, objects are identified only very temporarily, only insofar as they're immediately a source of pleasure. And the way that works, in, according to Freud, is that the memory of previous experiences with those objects either is associated with pleasure or unpleasure. So, for example, uh, the mother's breast could be associated with, with, with pleasure. But it's going to be different for each child, and it's not going to be uh, an objective. It's going to be what, associated with memory traces, memory images. Mm -hmm. See, And it's going to be highly volatile. In other words, and Freud talks about this, Freud says, if the repetition of a, of a previously remembered memory trace does not suffice to alleviate, for example, the tension of a child's being uh, thirsty or hungry, then the child will look for some other uh, image. So it's very, it's very unstable. And this instability uh, remains the basis for the kind of permutations that underlie the dream, according to Freud. In the dream, you have things that are totally shift, everything can be shifted into something else. Why? Because that's, that's primary process type thinking, uh, where it's not the object, qua stable object that counts, but the, 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 the memory of the, the ability of, a, of, a, of, a, of a, an image to be associated with pleasure or pain, let's say, tension. The secondary process is, is more what we're more familiar with, and has to do with uh, stable images, uh, recognizing things that stay the same, independently of their relation to pleasure and pain. So it's something that you get, you know, you acquire as you uh, grow older, and, and and so on. Words are an example of that, because when you see a word, in order to recognize it as a word, you have to bring to it a certain association of a set series of meanings. Otherwise, you it wouldn't be. But if you think more about it, you realize that those meanings there are lots of them. And they can, they can also destabilize the unity of the word. So the word for Freud can function both as primary process and in secondary, uh, you know, a secondary process. Um, um, he, in fact, he once defines the difference between the unconscious and the conscious uh, in terms of what he calls word and thing presentations. And the, 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 the conscious would be, which I, I would call self-conscious, is where you have 
a, a stable link between a word and a thing presentation. The unconscious is where that link is, is not stable anymore. Where you had the thing presentation being therefore uh, associated with different, or the word with different things, the thing with different words. Uh, and so you're, you're in a, a world there of, of volatile substitutability, you see. And there's always more or less, Freud is, is, is saying there's, there's always more or less of each going on, but there's, there's a preponderance uh, of one or the other in different situations. Now, what, uh, what, what Aaron Zweig does, I believe in his first book primarily, but uh, there, is to start with the dominant, the then dominant theory of perception, which was a, a gestaltist theory of perception. I'm not an expert in this field, so I don't know if that's still the major theory, but the, the, the gestaltist theory of perception that Ehrensorg describes in the, let's say, the 60s is one where you, uh, uh, basically the perceptual field is organized in a dualistic uh, way uh, uh, by what he calls figure and ground. You know? Uh, you have you focus on figures, and then you have a ground, a basis that sort of situates them. See, it's again like a visual correlative of, ant of, of antithetical or oppositional thinking. The figure is what counts. The ground is then there in order. You can't you can't imagine a figure in a, without a ground, but the the ground can be more or less complementary to the figure, and so on. And and uh, um, this binaryism. He says, car, uh, Aaron Zweig corresponds to the secondary process. But if he says, if there is such a thing as a, as a primary process, it would require a very, it would involve a very different perceptual experience and structure. And he, he thought that he found this evidences of this, um, he wasn't an analyst, so he didn't work with, any, with, with, you know, with patients, but he worked with children. And he, he, he argued that up until the age of what in, uh, psychoanalysis calls the latency period, around six or seven, children, many children were much freer in their drawings. Uh, and that at a certain point, they then became much more rigid and so on as sort of the reality principle imposed uh, themselves. And he, uh, he developed a theory of both representation and perception, um, which was not uh, dualistic in that sense of figure and ground, but involved things like scanning, and above all, involves something very crucial, which is that the, the importance of peripheral vision. And, and this, this is also gets close to the uncanny in a certain sense. He said peripheral vision, it, what it does is to do something that he claimed, and again, I'm not an expert in this field, he claimed that Gestalt the, theory had to be presupposed axiomatically, couldn't really problematize. And that is, what goes on when you frame the, 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 the field of vision? In other words, when you what's called the ground, it's the ground, interestingly, you know, for the philosophical problem as well. Uh, you, uh, because the ground is always limiting your field of vision, and there's always an outside. But you, although at any one point you can look at a certain point outside, you can't be outside <coughs> everywhere all the time, and so on. And he says that things happen on the periphery. Uh, you have so often, you know, uh, senses of perception that are. Uh, you know, don't fit in exactly, but that indicate that the periphery is not just a, a neutral demar line of demarcation, but an active, an active uh, uh, factor in allowing you to focus on figure and ground, but also constantly, you know, defocusing you on, on what's going on. And he also emphasized then what he calls scanning as a way of not just reducing uh, elements within the field of vision to a kind of a figure ground uh, uh, relationship there. So, um, and he, he also then in the second book sort of connected this to developments in modern art and so on and so forth. So you might, you know, and D Lyotard wrote a very interesting introduction to the French translation, which I think, and in the meanwhile, there, I, he, he wrote, Aaron Schweig actually wrote in English, although he was Austrian because he was working in London. So the two books that I mentioned, should, they're out of print, but they should be, you know, available if you check out and uh, and Lyotard was, very, was also very, you know, very, very interested in that. But that, uh, what he was doing there was to problematize something that Derrida later on would be very, very interested in, and that is the function of the frame. You see, the, every, that you're always framing things, but that uh, the question of does the frame belong to the inside, or is it merely an accessory that allows you know, the inside to be focused on? And Derrida does, uh, deals with this in, a, in, a, in his book, uh, I think it's called Truth in Painting. Uh, and in, particularly in connection with Kant, interestingly enough, 
but not only. Also, because Kant has a discussion in the Third Critique where he says, basically, the frame is a paragon; it's an ornament. It's an ornament. Uh, it doesn't really uh, c uh, contribute to the aesthetic quality of what it frames. You see, and and so uh, uh, um, the the the. Uh, what he's developing, however, in this text is, is, is related but different from that because the frame is something that you can say is, ex, is, is on the margin of, the, of whatever is framing. What Derrida wants to argue, though, is that the problem of the frame, which not only separates but links, that's his argument. The frame is a joint. It separates but links to what can never be included in any determinate field. Uh, he says that also is internal to the field itself. See, uh, there is no element within the field that isn't split in the way that the frame also involves a kind of split by both uh, separating and connecting the framed with whatever is outside of the frame, the or cadre, as, as he puts it in French, the, the, the ex external, you see. So, and this is a... Uh, this is, I think, uh, uh, you know, interesting. And here's where, uh, in order to make that point, he resorts what seems to be to, to a more temporal argumentation with repetition, with iterability, than a spatial one. Although the two are never really, are never really fully separable. Uh, uh, because uh, uh, there's no way you could define a place in a way that wouldn't include its temporization, it's, it's a, if the frame, that any frame that frames a place, and a place, is, let's say, as a container, links that place to what's outside it, then the place uh, is inevitably temporal, mm -hmm. as well as being spatial. You see, it, it's never simply self-contained. It's always constituted potentially by the relation to what is coming next. And that's something that he tries to uh, you know, in a way to argue is, is the case in what he calls the mark, the, the building block of, uh, of, of uh, for example, linguistic statements here uh, uh, with this iterability. Uh, uh, there. So that's, uh, and, and that's of course harder to visualize. But one of the things I want to do uh, this afternoon is to try to argue that Nietzsche has a somewhat similar uh, notion where he tries to talk about the eternal return and so on. Uh, and that hasn't been that hasn't been sufficiently recognized in English, in part because of problems of translation. But that's for, that's for later. That, that, that's for this. So that the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the quintessence of this now has to do with the fact that what you might call the moment, the moment, is not to be conceived of as a, a self-contained building block that's absolutely self-identical, but as a dividing line. The dividing, the, the now, is not self-present the way a circle might be considered, but it's 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 present as a divider, as a, as a point of transition. You see, uh, that's sort of that, that and that's where the, the, the whole question of iter iterability uh, sort of enter, enters enters the, uh, the the picture. If uh, do you have any questions directly to that? Because the, the the text this is now a point where we can come to the where we left off yesterday, and I think it will in part, hopefully, speak to that, but I'd be happy to, to address any yeah, questions. Just quickly, questions. I got the psychoanalytic theory of vision. I didn't get the title of the other book. Yeah. I got the title of the psychoanalytic theory of vision. The other one is called The Hidden Order of Art. And, you know, my memory is awful. So, uh, you know, everything I'm... But, but if you have Anton Ehrenzweig, you'll be able to find it. And that was E-H-R-E-N-Z-W-E-I-G. E-H-R-E-N-Z-W-E-I-G. E H R E N. Yeah. Yeah. Aaron, uh, Aaron's like, yeah. I can't tell you how often I have been surprised by things I had so clearly in memory, and I went back. And in fact, with films, I was going to bring a film. I, 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 films do do exist in different versions, I think. So that's my only hope, <laughs> because I remembered something, and I went back in a film that I wanted to sort of maybe discuss here. And the, the version I had it doesn't have it at all. It's the way I remember yeah. it. Nothing. Many times, yeah, it's it's part. So, uh, you know, there I was really, I mean, but I have to now find and see whether I just totally can fantasize. Well, if you got it at Blockbuster, they sanitized it. 
I don't know where I, no, I got this at the FNAC in Paris, actually. Yeah. Two yeah. volume. Uh, yeah. Or, yeah. Frequently, I, I work with film, like teaching film a bit. Yeah. A lot, a lot of times I'll have like, oh yeah, this is the scene that's coming up and it's been completely cut out or they recut the order of it to totally make a different but, or, or they can substitute other scenes? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, yeah. uh, because this is really amazing. I really... Uh, the two things I wanted to, sh to talk about was uh, neither was in the film version. This is a, a, a kaki musha. Huh? Yeah. Or kaki musha. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, or the, the, the warrior, the shadow warrior, is the way, you know, which is, I think is a great film, yes. but I think it's a lot better the way I remember it than the, in the DVD <laughs> that I got, you know. So, which looked very strange, too, because the color was, looked like it had been recolored or something. I don't know. It was, uh, mm -hmm. But uh, I don't want to, you know, I hope that's the case. But I've had other cases where it's, I've really been proven to me that my memory, or I had again and again, this, this, often with film, actually, when I think of it. So maybe, maybe it's... You know. There's also a thing with uh, copyright, that after a certain point, it, the family loses it. And like, isn't that why they came up with the 1985 version of Ulysses? Yeah, the right, sure. The family turned over the text and yes. said, come up with a new edit in, and it... Oh, edit totally of it, and it was so substantially different that they were able to research different. the copyright. Absolutely, yeah. But you know, with film, you're always surprised. You think somehow, uh, at least, you know, if I, I, the version that I saw presumably was a commercial version. I'm not a film specialist. I didn't. I never got invited to a director's cut by uh, Kurosawa or something like that. You know, much as I would have liked to. So I'm going to have to pursue this because this I really uh, it's very important to me. This scene that I remember that I can't find anymore. You know, I have to find I, the thing to do is find somebody who knows Kurosawa very well, the films, and see if if it rings. But it's also something that that, that people wouldn't necessarily notice. Doesn't contribute to the story, you know. Go to old videotapes of it. Old videotapes rather than new DVDs. I see. Yeah, I, I haven't destroyed them. I, you know, I, at a certain point, I went through all the old videotape, the VHSs that I had. I said, you know, the quality is awful. I don't want to keep them. Get rid of them. And then now I realize I've made a bit of a huge mistake here. So. Anyway, you know, so, 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 uh, 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 so anyway, but uh, this is the way I remember the title, so, you know, without, uh, on the German weather, they don't do this anymore, the German TV weather, they used to, they used to have a formula, we're giving you the weather without guarantee, <laughs> that's <laughs> ohne Gewehr, they used to say, you know, uh, this they don't do anymore either in German TV, but, but I, I, this I know, I think, I hope, I didn't invent, I, I wouldn't be capable of inventing that, I don't think, although, it's hard to know what you're capable of doing. You know? So anyway, uh, uh, any other uh, questions on this before we now look at the text where we left off, which picks up precisely on this question. Uh, uh, in other words, I would uh, uh, I would say that one of the key input, one of the key consequences of this discussion for Derrida is a kind of irreducible divisibility. D uh, divisibility. I gave a talk here last, last uh, uh, the talk I gave last year, uh, I don't know whether I had, what the title was, something about invis visibility, invisibility, and divisibility, which uh, uh, tried to, to deal a little bit with that, the question that it's not just a question of whether something is visible or it's opposite, invisible, that would be the, the, the binaryism, the dualism there, but it's something that is visible as divisible. That, that becomes a different, you know, a different kind of, thing. and that's what Derrida is here uh, uh, going to try to, to talk about. So, picking up at the middle of page forty-eight, there, where he's been responding to to uh, uh, Cyril, such iterability is inseparable from the structure of the end of the uh, the end of the first long paragraph. Such iterability is inseparable from the structural possibility in which it is necessarily inscribed. To object by citing cases where absence appears, in fact appears, in fact, not to be observable is like objecting that a mark is not essentially iterable because here and there it, is, it has not, in fact, been repeated. This is, by the way, a good example, you're right, about uh, something that looks like an ontology. You see, when he, he is using a language of essence here. You know, it, it's true. I think his, his argument would be that it's the only essence that de-essentializes itself because it provides for uh, a discontinuity in its uh, instantiations, a constitutive discontinuity in instantiations. You see, so uh, that, that's because it's true that this is one. The, the whole these are the motifs associate, associated with iterability, such as divisibility, come back again and again in lots of different contexts. Most uh, toward the end of his life, for example, one of the last books he writes, 
uh, rogues, which is about democracy and, and sovereignty, uh, the, or the main argument there is to try to argue that sovereignty is, cons is, is constitutionally divisible. And this goes against the, the, the main theories of sovereignty as being indivisible, you know, uh, uh, there. And so it comes back again and again, uh, but hopefully, at least, in ways which allow for the singular differences of the, of the, of the context to emerge, rather than as a kind of imposing of, a, of, a, of an ontological or you know, eternal scheme. But there's, surely, you know, you're right. Uh, and I don't think any, no one can, I don't think any thinker, anyone can function with pure variables. Did you see what I mean? <coughs> that, that, that's a, the, the difference maybe one, a slight difference between Derrida and Nietzsche would be, uh, and I'm not sure that it, 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 it's a difference in all points, would be that although, that for both of them, there is no ontological underlying natural reality. There are only rel relations of forces that impose uh, 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 hierarchies of values, you see. But not just intellectually, also socially and politically and economically and so on. And uh, um, you're always, uh, this is the Derridian point of view, it's important to be as aware as possible of the particular relation of forces within which you are functioning. You see, and that requires, in order then to be able to transform it, to intervene in a transformative way, you see. Um, so that, uh, that complicates the idea that everything is chaotic at bottom and that, you know, you, you and I think this is a difference with, with, with Baudrillard, by the way, although I don't know Baudrillard's work all that well, but um, uh, I know the early work, but I don't, didn't follow all the later stuff that, uh, that well. But I think, you know, for, for, for Derry, Derrida, uh, you know, um, the notion of reality, for, you know, for example, did the, the, the war, what is it, the war never took, what is the famous thing of Bodhya? Something war never, never took the place. Gulf, what, the Gulf War. The Gulf War, right, never took, never took place. Derrida, you know, would never be tempted by a statement like that. He would say it took place, but the place it took, it has a certain reality. It can't be absolutized. It has to be seen, you know, as a non not totally contingent happening by any means, but not as, a, as an inevitable, natural, uh, unchangeable, part of an unchangeable system. So in that sense, Derrida is sort of situated between a critical, uh, almost a Galian position, which he wouldn't endorse, and a Nietzschean position. Uh, in that, I think he thinks of uh, thinking as always interventionist. But when you intervene, it means that you accept, acknowledge a certain point of departure, uh, and even a history of the point. It's not just a point of departure, but and that's what he's trying, I think, constantly to do with this sort of quote deconstructive move to figure out, you know, what are the forces and strategies that allowed certain relationships to impose themselves? What do they ex what do they exclude in the process, and what are the possibilities, therefore, of developing uh, in, uh, uh, alter interventions that would that would that would uh, Possibly transform, or open up, open up or avenues of transformation. I think that's really, you know that's sort of his. Uh, so it's in between there. It's it's not that everything is chaotic and you know you just. Uh, 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 although he does share with Nietzsche a certain you know anti ontological, but he also ironically enough with Heidegger, with what what's, what often is not realized. Uh, uh, Heidegger has something called being in time. That Heidegger's notion of being is anti-ontological in, in the sense of traditional ontology, or at least is intended, intended to be, let's put it that way, wants to be anti-ontological. And, and that's why Heidegger also later on, in the late 30s and uh, 40s, actually uh, talks less and less about being and, and talks about what he calls the event, you see. Uh, and this, this notion of, of event, that, he doesn't, uh, that's not for him an inconsistency, but it's a, um, and, and Heidegger is, in, in often in his writings, despite being in some ways terribly autocratic and so on, is saying that the language that he's developing has to be seen as provisional, and that it's not, you know, it's looking to a future that will be different, and, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so it, it isn't as if Heidegger ever had the sense of, of presenting a complete and finished system, or at least I think that's, uh, uh, you know, clear. 
That's why he never, for example, he being in time was announced as part one, and there was a second part that was supposed, that second part per se was never published, by not in his lifetime, and it, what they it, after his death now they're publishing all of his papers and so on. Um, it, they published attempts of his to uh, do something which would be a, a philosophy of the event and so on, uh, but they're unfinished. And he wasn't satisfied with them, to, you know, uh, either. So there's that kind of tentative. Uh, Dimension. For the difference between Heidegger and Derrida, I think, is that for Derrida, this unsatisfaction is inevitable. You know, he didn't have the idea ever of producing something that would be a comprehensive, in some sense, uh, stable system of sorts in some way. So, um, okay, the, the, what he's going to do now here in the next in the next uh, paragraph is precisely to problematize the, the notion of in fact. You see. Let's go a bit further. Does this kind of fact really exist? Where can we find it? How can we recognize it? Here we reach another type of analysis and of necessity. Isn't the apparent fact of the sender's or receiver's presence complicated, divided, contaminated, parasited by the possibility of an absence inasmuch as this possibility is necessarily inscribed in the functioning of the mark? You see, the, the, the move there is very much in, uh, in consistency with what Nietzsche is describing, uh, where uh, the opposition of presence and absence is not seen to be antithetical in the sense of mutually exclusive. Because you have one, you don't have the other, because you, but rather to be a, a kind of law of contamination or of parasiting or, and so on, the, of interrelationship, of interaction there. That, and... Um, uh, so that the possibility of an absence is already inscribed in the functioning of the mark. This is a logic, or rather graphics, to which sex seeks to do justice. As soon as the possibility is essential and necessary, qua possibility, uh, I'm skipping there, it can no longer either de facto or de jure be bracketed, excluded, shunted aside even temporarily on allegedly methodological grounds. He had originally developed, I think, a very interesting discussion of Austin, with which Searle took issue, where Austin says um, certain uh, uses of language on the stage are legitimate, but they're also marginal to speech act theory because they're, they're, everybody knows that they're fictional, that, you know, the, that the, the actor doesn't uh, mean what he says immediately. And so uh, uh, Austin said these are marginal cases that we can put aside in order to construct our system on the basis of what people mostly, generally, really, the way they really speak, and then we'll worry about the marginal cases later on, you see. And you see, again, it's the frame, and so on. Derrida says, no, no, you have to worry from the beginning. You have to have a general, if you're going to have a general theory, it has to, from the beginning, include the possibility of such a use of language, and raise the question of whether that is, even if it's, if it's empirically uh, marginal, uh, if it isn't, o there isn't always some element of that even in what appears to be non-theatrical uses Austin of language. Who? Huh? Austin who? J.L. Austin. Uh, sorry, John, John, uh, J.L. Austin is the, the founder of speech act theory. It's A-U-S-T-I-N. He's a Brit. Right. It's also, he, he was the one who, who sort of introduced this idea of uh, language as performance, basically. Uh, you know, language, and uh, it was very influential. His main book is called How to Do Things with Words. But it's also very interesting to compare, by the way, very interesting sociologically, intellectually, to compare the tenor of Austin's writing uh, with, it, with the way Searle writes. Searle wrote a book then, and Searle was con considered sort of the, the main follower and interpreter of Austin in the U.S. and after Austin. And he wrote a book called Speech Act Theory. The different, see, already you see the difference. Austin's book is a series of essays and the, the, the title is drawn from one of the essays, How to Do thing with, Things with Words. You know, that's not the declaration of a system. <laughs> Searle is doing speech act theory. Okay. So it's not just that Austin is a Brit, Austin is an aristocratic Brit. That too. <laughs> and Searle is, 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 is a, 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 a non-aristocratic non American who is intent on establishing a certain authority in a very, very different way from uh, the way or, uh, you know, aristocratic Brits do it. 
with understatement and irony and so so it's very interesting to compare Austin didn't, never wrote uh, you know a systematic treatise so, or at least not to my knowledge he writes lots of individual essays again taking points you know and then trying to inter interpret them but always very ironically and so on Searle doesn't have an ironic bone in his intellectual body uh, he can be very aggressive, but he's not ironic at all, at all. So it's quite interesting to see the differences here, which are you know intellectual, sociological, and uh, uh, I would say Derrida, by the way, is somewhere in between. I mean, he's not a Brit, he's not an American. Uh, sociologically, he's also not an aristocrat, and he's not a proletarian either. I don't know what what Searle's. Uh, I think Searle was part, by the way, American Indian. Is part of that. Is part. Of um, Whatever it is, a oh, chip on his shoulder. Oh yeah, that's that's, uh, I've, that's what I've heard. Yeah, that's my experience. Um, but uh, uh, Derrida was definitely an outsider. You know, his background uh, growing up as a, as a Jew in Algeria uh, and being, you know, thrown out of school when uh, Vichy excluded Jews from schools in 41 and so on. And he's written, written about this. So he has a very, very ambivalent relation to the mainstream French, you know, tradition. A he writes about this, a love-hate relationship to it. He wants to be accepted by it, but he wants to totally, you know, uh, screw it in some sense. Uh, and they, they're both, you know, and, and that and the tradition reacted ferociously uh, to that. He never, uh, Derrida never acceded to uh, the kind of prestige within France that he had outside of uh, outside of France. Uh, normally, under normal circumstances, you would have expected him, as well as Deleuze, by the way, mm -hmm. for different reasons, to be elected to the famous Collège de France. Mm -hmm. You know, but neither of them were. They were both proposed. There was no way. Uh, uh, Derrida was a good. The way you get into those places, you have friends. I mean, as well as being well known. And Derrida had a very good friend who was in the Collège de France with whom he argued, but it was basically a very good friend. It was Pierre Bourdieu. Mm -hmm. They were both Pierre Noir. They they'd been you know uh, Bourdieu was his teacher, I think, at the École Normale actually, and they were, were very close friends. Um, and so Bourdieu tried to propose him, as a, and he didn't have a chance. And in fact, he only got a quasi-academic position, to my knowledge, because, because the socialist government, which, on which he was with good terms, Mitterrand's government, proposed to give a chair, a new chair to the, it's called the École des Hautes Études, uh, Sciences Sociales, uh, that, the, that the École would be able to keep after Derrida. So they basically, the socialist government bought off the, the, in order to to give Derrida a position, R Paul Ricoeur wanted Derrida, you know, Derrida to be his successor at Nanterre, mm -hmm. and Derrida wrote, a th you know, sort of did the, what he what he needed to to get the, the formal qualifications that, and then was turned down, turned down for somebody who was really, you know, very very uh, mediocre compared to I think uh, compared compared to Derrida and so on. And you know, and the same thing. It's, it's very interesting in France. If you have the you know the view from outsiders looking in, uh, you can have a very skewed view because you can think that all the people who are recognized outside of France would necessarily be recognized inside. But that's not not all the case. Deleuze is another case. Deleuze, you know, should have been in the Collège de France, and you know, was never uh, was never uh, accepted by his peers. You know, never, and, and, and so on. And uh, Lyotard was another. You know, another such case, and, uh, and so on. So, in a certain sense, Foucault and Barthes, who were elected, were are sort of exceptions. They also came at a different period. They came during the '60s when there was, you know, a lot of more ferment and so on. And, uh, but so in a strange way, huh? is that, that's essentially the equivalent to the American Academy of Arts and Letters. It's much more than that. No, because it's a, it's a, it's an institution that uh, you know pays its members. It, there is, it would be closer to the Princeton Institute of Advanced Study, okay. actually, except that it's a national institution. <laughs> it's cl very close to the Institute of Advanced Study in the sense you're appointed for life, and you have minimal teaching. Your teaching is you have to teach a public course for a few weeks, and you know, every, it has to be open to everybody, and so on. This is a tradition. Mm -hmm. So you don't really, it's not professional training, or you know, you, and, uh, and you can do whatever you want there. It's a, and uh, so it's the most prestigious thing that they have. France is very interesting because from the, the French Revolution and then the Napoleonic period on, it created within a republican system uh, a very elite system that was there, in other words, that was there to both confirm the, what, the, the ordinary mediocrity of the, of the other institutions, which hated them, 
to call the, and at the same time to provide uh, a place where the, 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 those who were considered really exceptional could function un, uh, un, untroubled by the, so you have this tremendous tension in France between what's called the Grand École, you know, which are these uh, the École Normale Supérieure and so on and so forth. They're all coming from the, the, the idea was that you had the confluence of the French Revolution and Napoleon, i.e. French Revolution egalitarian, Napoleon uh, emperor, how do you get those two together? Uh, a so-called uh, meritocracy, you know, so that these schools are open, the school they go on, they call it open to exams. You have to prepare, you have to give two years of your life preparing to even take the exam, you know, after your high school. You get to high school, then if you're good, you can go to a special class that prepares you for these exams. If you don't make the exam, you simply go right into the university. It counts as the first two years of university. And if you do, you become then a, a civil service employee. You're, you're, you're sure for life in some sense there in these, in these schools. And um, the idea then is that within a demo, you know, there's supposed to be equality of opportunity. But of course, as, Bo as Bourdieu above all, and others, you know, documented, uh, there's tremendous un inequality because if you come from a family that has, you know, academic background or a class, you have an infinite better chance than if you come from a working class or, or, or you know, or background. So it's highly, but that's the way the French system is, is set up. So you have these, these grands écoles, and then you have a, 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 another thing that's very special, which is école de haute études, which is the only grande école, special, special higher institution, where research is the essential part of what you do. Because the, I'll never forget uh, when Bourdieu and his associate Passeron came out with a book on French education. I think it was in the 60s or 70s. It had the, he wrote a book on French education, higher education, and he called it Reproduction. And I, I think I was in Germany at the time. And I didn't know too much about France. And I said, you know, as an American, I said, how can you write a book on, on higher education and call it Reproduction? You know, we don't do that. I mean, no matter what you think of the American educational system, it would never try to justify it by saying you're there to reproduce. But that is precisely the, 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 the purpose of the whole French system of education, to reproduce what has been established and to produce good citizens. And that means that research, in the sense of anything that would really shake up the envelope a bit and work out of the box, is not really you know, where it's at. Erudition is where it's at. So you get very erudite studies, but not studies that want to, you know, break new ground. The American system is much more, in a way, market-oriented. In order for you to succeed on the market, you have to come up with new and, quote, better or these more interesting products. And so that, one of the good things about that is that it, at a certain level, it justifies innovation. So, you know, even in, 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 it's getting worse in the U.S. now with the economic crisis, but still, even in many, 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 you know, universities that aren't absolutely top tier, there's still a, a possibility of doing some research. But in the French system, that, that's absolutely secondary. The only research that counts is the, the, the accumulation and, and, and passing on of, this, of established knowledge. So you get, a, you know, extremely erudite. And, I mean, this isn't true of all cases. For example, French math. French science are very, you know, are very uh, innovative and, 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 and so on. Uh, so it isn't, but in the humanities, it tends to be, to look a lot like that. So uh, when they created this, this uh, École des Hautes Études en Sciences Sociales, E-H-E-S-S, that they specifically said this would have as its mission to train people in techniques of research. And the French have another institution that's very much under fire today, which is only for research. It's called the Center, the National Center for Research, CNRS, National Center for Scientific Research. It's something you take an exam, it's set up into, into groups, and if you're accepted into, you, you know, you again have a life, to, you know, a tenured position, not necessarily at a high salary, where you don't do any teaching. It's changing now. Now they're beginning to, you know, and people who do that get very lonely, you know, they're, they're very cut off. I mean, you, you know, in the in the U.S., you tend to sort of groan, you know, at all the teaching you have to do. But in, if you're in the CNRS, you 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 know, you don't groan, but you're sort of suffered by having lack of, of of contact with people and so on. So you see, it's a very very different system, and that's why the idea of and it's being reinforced today as well. You know, what is the strategy of education? Well, it's mainly to 
teach people how to read, write, calculate, pass on established knowledge, reproduce. That's his, his book, re, you know, reproduction uh, uh, there. So um, uh, that's the background, you see, against it. So what does Derrida do? He, he comes into this situation and he takes the, the essence, one of the essential dimensions of reproduction, which is repetition. And he says, you think you're reproducing, okay, but in reproducing, you're repeating and you're inevitably changing, whether you like it or not. You see? This is a sort of sociological background, which isn't obvious to an American, but we don't have the, we, I think we have similar problems, but they don't, they don't take the same form. They don't take the, you know, uh, uh, in America, you get into trouble if you innovate in a way that makes people uncertain. People are already uncertain enough, and they don't want to be more uncertain by being told you know, that uh, their value systems are tentative or are you know, not as they seem and so on and so forth. And they will uh, react very often very aggressively you know, to that. But of course, you have very different systems. I say one is a market-oriented society where innovation is built in, as it were, some sort of innovation. And the other is essentially, uh, uh, I don't know how to put it, uh, a, a very stable, you know, in, I also see it as a difference between a, a, a predominantly Catholic and a predominantly Protestant <laughs> society as well. You know, even though the religiosity in France is very limited, it's not direct, see, but the idea that the institutions are, 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 are very stable. You can't imagine, how even, uh, I was in Germany in, in 68, and the, the, the contrast between the German, what was going on in Germany and what was going on around May 68 in France, for me, was, 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 was amazing because in France, for example, the family structure was largely intact and remained, the, 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 your, you, you, know, you defined yourself, with, and I think in, in a, lot, a large part of Europe. In Germany, it had already been destroyed largely and discredited by the Nazi period. Uh, and by you know, things going before, so that there was no nobody was defined themselves, you know, with respect to the family, and the institutions were also followed. You know, family is a very important institution because it's a link between you know your your childhood and adulthood, between what I'm calling the singular and the general, and uh, uh, and in France the important link is the school. You see, that's why right now there's a real fundamental crisis in France, maybe elsewhere as well because the school is in crisis. Because up to the 1980s or so, up to a certain turning point in the, in the post-war period, the school uh, could justify its, its uh, mission of transmitting knowledge in order to reproduce citizens by the, the very real promise of economic integration and advancement. And from the 80s on, that promise began to break down. In other words, people from the ghettos, the children of Algerian immigrants and so on, began to realize that they were going to have a very, very hard time, and that the school was the place where they were being told that they, if, they did, if they played the game, they would be, and they were discovering it wasn't true. And everything that's happened since then, increasing violence, uh, uh, uses the school very often as a center. There's a lot of violence in the schools against teachers, uh, not only on the part of students, but parents will also come in and beat up the teachers, you know, and so on. It's, not, it's no fun, I mean, for it to be a... Uh, uh, and it's, it's critical in a way that it would never be critical in the U.S. Um, because uh, the school doesn't have that function in the, in the, in the U.S. You know, the, the, you have a very different type of social uh, integration in the U.S. Whereas in France, everything goes via the school and the establishment. You know, the institutions play a, an enormous role. It's also very interesting to, to, to link up, excuse this, this, this survey, but, uh, but it's, I think it's interesting. The French have a word that, that stresses the importance of institutions. That is very interesting. Uh, it's encadrement. The basic is framing. You're framing, yeah, but in a, in a positive sense. Interesting, the US, you're, the word framing is like you're swindled. I've been framed. Been framed yeah. Yeah? In France, uh, you, know, you know for in France, those of you who work in film, uh, the, you know the, the, what the, the film photographer is called, the cameraman. It's, yeah. Um. Cadreur. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Framer. Yeah. The film, uh, yeah. and it's also very interesting in the sense that the most important person uh, in the actual technical filming process in France is the uh, 
directeur de, de, de photo, une personne qui travaille sur les lighting arrangements et so on. Vous voyez, so the French, you see, the French have a very uh, structural, not to say structuralist, mm. sense of reality, very different from the American. The American sense of reality is focusing on the individual and the individual's relation to what's going on, but the individual is sort of the point of departure and arrival. Whereas in France, it, it's the, 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 the whole, the feel, the, the frame, and therefore the, you know, the, 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 the institutions. And therefore, this importance of, you know, of, of encadrement and of, of, for example, cadre. You know, cadre in, in, in English, I believe, cadre is a, is a disreputable word to describe kind of Marxist, uh, no, or uh, when you say a cadre, it's oh, only a... I feel like a, a posse, a group of... Like a couple, yeah, like a couple or something like something that. Something like that. Yeah. But in France, it's, it's, and maybe, I don't know, it's in Portuguese, it probably might be similar, huh? In France, it goes right across... It's in business. It's in. It's a higher. Uh, you know. It's a decision making sort of higher placed official. Is a is a who helps. You know. Uh, we, quadre. Huh? Quadre. 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 technical. Uh, yeah. You have technical expertise. Technical in, uh, expertise yeah. and so on. Expertise to the institution yeah. So <laughs> it's the, uh, so where it's, it's quite yeah, interesting. Yeah, but the is not really free. Um, yeah. I think I think in. When it's used in an institution, mm -hmm. it's back to the frame because it's the expert, is, yeah. has its own validity and gives validity to the firm it belongs to, I, 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 in that sense. It's also very interesting. My sense is that in the English-speaking world, at least the American English, what would correspond to that is something like decision-maker, mm -hmm. you know? So you have a very different sense, you see. A decision is someone who, uh, etymologically, Now, a small This group is the OED. Right, 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 right. Small group of people, cadre, uh, especially trained for a particular purpose or profession, but it's not very much used. You know, it's got like elitist English. associations with it. Right. In, in English, it seems to. So it's kind of like a, it's not a good thing. It's, it's not a good thing, exactly. It's not, you know, it's like. A communist group. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And so it's connected with framed. Mm -hmm. You know, framed is interesting, but framed is almost like uh, illicit, elite. To be framed is to be, you know, illicitly convicted of a crime you didn't do. So it's quite a ama I mean, or cheated, or, right? Yeah. Or cheated, right? You've, been, yeah. you've been framed. So it's yeah. also when someone. Well, there's uh, an implied conspiracy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, to be framed. It's like you're put in a box. Mm -hmm. Like, like one of the really uh, positive, I, 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 I think, American expressions mm -hmm. is thinking out of the box. Mm -hmm. You see. And uh, whereas, if something goes wrong in France, politically particularly, but not just politically, do you know what, what the expression that's used? Let's say somebody has made a, a mistake or an error, or a, uh, he has to go back and do his homework. And it's even, it's even more than that, it's revoir sa copie. Oh. A double, uh, literally, revisit or re review his copy. That comes from school. Mm -hmm. In school, you're copying. And by the way, if you've ever taught in France, it's quite interesting too, in the university, everybody sits with a notebook and writes from beginning to end what you say. And at the end of the year, that's what they're tested on. That's, you know, discussion. You know, I, I drove, I taught a few times in France, I drove my classes crazy <laughs> with this kind of, you know. I said, what, who is, you know, there they were. And, you know, I remember I was talking about, it was Wagner, I was, it was in the theater department and so on, I was working on The Ring. And, you know, they wanted, stuff that they could write, information that they could, and, uh, you know, write, write, write down. So in France, if you make a mistake, you have to, you just haven't done your homework. And, but again, you see why somebody like Derrida could, could, could do what he tries to do here, because of revoir, that, that's already the re, revisit or review, mm -hmm. and your copy is a copy, you know, it's also already a, and that's what they say, that you have to revoir sa copie. I don't know if you have this in, 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 in Portuguese. In Port this, I think, is specifically French. You know? Right, right, right. At the same time, just to complete this, then we'll take a, we'll take a short break. The French word, you know, the French word repetition is also very, very, because it also means rehearsal. Mm -hmm. So repetition, rehearsal, it's not just oriented to the past, but it's a preparation for the future and in a theatrical Uh, or, but it also can be in a training. You can rehearse, you know, what you're, you're, the part you're going to play, and 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 and, and uh, so on. So you know, you have all of this. Uh, but just uh, one last remark about this. 
uh, before the break, and that is that it, it often struck me that what Saussure is describing, Saussure, of course, is, 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 uh, is Swiss, French Swiss, but it struck me that what he's describing seems to me to be very, very close to the way the French live reality. You don't have to be a linguist. Why? In other words, and I think it derives from the court. You know, your, your position in a court derives, I mean, your value in a court derives from the way your position with respect to everyone else around you, and above all, the sovereign and those who have access to the sovereign. So, in other words, uh, everything you are depends on where you are in connection to everyone else. So this gives you both an agonistic but a heightened, heightened sense of the other uh, there. The way in which Americans who are in Paris often experience this, and I speak from, from my own experience as well as that of students, is go into a bakery or any store, and start looking at all the, you know, the things that are there, and suddenly they get the idea that everybody is going in front of them. And they realize they have no idea where they're positioned in, term, you know, in, the, in the line that isn't linear. But everyone in, the, in all the French in the bakery will know exactly yeah. where they are compared to everyone else. You know? yeah. The first thing they notice is that. The, the, the poor American comes in and sees you know, the, the croissant, the this and that, and so on. And then just notice he or she isn't being served. And people are brusque enough. Because the, the, the French, who are very aware, also notice that the American has no idea mm -hmm. of where he is. And so that's just an, inv it's an invitation because social life in France means mastering the rules. You see, This is exactly what Saussure is saying. The value of a signifier is determined not by what it seems to, de to, to, to denominate, but by its relation, its differential relation to everything surrounds it, you see. Uh, so you're, and this I think is everyday, everyday reality in, uh, in, in Paris at least. It, it, it expresses them in all kinds of, of interesting ways, but they all involve this awareness of the, of the other. For example, there's very little space in the Parisian streets, you know, on the, on the sidewalks. The Parisians will, without looking, apparently looking, glide with ever, out, ever touching <laughs> you. This doesn't even hold for the French coming from the provinces, much less for any foreigner. The foreigner will look at the bang, boom, <laughs> so on, you know, it's all over the, whereas the, 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 the so, so you see that there is a kind of cultural awareness. This doesn't mean, however, necessarily uh, uh, acknowledgement, respect, because it's usually very agonistic. But it is a reason why, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the problem of the other could be so easy, you know, so foregrounded in so much French literature and theory and so on and so forth. Uh, and, and it is, it does seem to me to be, in a certain sense, uh, anti-individualist in the way in which, let's say, a, a Catholic as opposed to a Protestant, a court as opposed to maybe a, a, a dem so-called democratic or, or something like that society, uh, you know, society could be. Although, obviously, these are all simplifications and so on. So uh, we can take a short break. What I'm going to do is to read some of the, what I think would be some of the more crucial statements and then invite you to respond, you know, if you, uh, and, and so on, because none of this is, is self-evident or, you know, or, or, or obvious. So I, I'm at the sort of the following up this question of the fact. Are, is there such a thing as a fact that would eliminate this issue of, uh, of, of, of uh, divisibility, iterability, and so on? Uh, sort of about... 10 lines from the bottom of the same page 48. Um, Inasmuch then as it's essential and structural, this possibility is always at work marking all the facts, all the events, even those which appear to disguise it. Just as iterability, which is not iteration, can be recognized even in a mark, which in fact seems to have occurred only once. You see, that, that was the point, again, with Cratylus. Really. Not even once. I mean, that's... Uh, and it seems to me, I have, a, I have a, a, a slight emendation to make about it, or the way I read it is not exactly the way it's formulated here. It seems to me what he's saying in this whole argument is that has to do with what I would call identifiability or recognizability. It, it requires that in order for something to be identifiable, it must be recognizable. In order for it to be, rec you, know, you can't identify something once. In order for it to be recognizable, it involves a, a, a relationship of, of some sort of repetition or recurrence. 
there. And that relationship involves a, 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 a mix of sameness and difference, you see. And in our normal procedures, we minimize the difference in order to emphasize the sameness. There has to be always a little bit of, if, if there were no difference at all, it would be totally uh, superfluous to repeat, you know, we've done. So there has to be some minimal difference, but the importance of the difference, we tend to minimalize, you see, whether in well, using language or gesture or, or whatever, you know, whatever we're, we're doing. So it seems to me that, in other words, the way he's formulating it he, throughout this essay, it's as though it were a kind of in, a property of the mark. And it seems to me it's only a property of the mark insofar as the mark uh, is presents itself as something that has to be recognized, has to be identified, <coughs> you see. Uh, and and uh, that's, it seemed to be a slight but important, you know, shift. Uh, I'm sorry he's not here that I can't ask him about that, you know, many other. Uh, so I, 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 that's in a way to clarify. My, but but the the um, uh, the key point here is that the 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 elemental bedrock of what we take to be reality and identity, which is that something is itself without necessarily or essentially relating to something outside of itself is already uh, compromised by the fact that the, 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 the relation to self presupposes this repetitive, recognizable -cogn structure, you see. And, that one, and that's where you get into both time, repetition, uh, and so on, difference being, in a way, uh, uh, con con constitutive there. And uh, th the other point is that he's dealing, though, th this is something that has to be conceived of on the level of potentiality or possibility. Because once you have identified something, you're already, you've already performed the process of eliminating sufficient amount of difference to say this is what it is. So it's not an act of iteration. For, for Derrida, uh, actuality, which by the way in French, is, uh, is a, almost a synonym for reality. Actually, you know the the, uh, 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 but um, uh, which which um, which at the same time carries with it the temporal connotation of a certain type of nowness, of, of presentness. Yeah, the act, words actual, and uh, it, it's this presentness that he's trying to suggest is structurally in advance divided. Bef above and beyond any particular instantiation of it. At the same time, we'll always be dealing with instantiations. So there is no pure realm of, of, of possibility. It's not a platonic idea. Something that will always be instantiated, uh, recognized, and so on. But that's why the, 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 the dimension of the, of the factual can't be exclusively appealed to in order to uh, uh, discuss whether or not uh, facts are uh, in themselves uh, self-evident and self-contained, mm -hmm. and he's trying, and he's linking that to a certain. Um, I mean, he, he's using the word mark. I'm not sure where he, you know, why he uses the word mark. I know that he doesn't like the word. I prefer the word signif signifier. Um, uh, uh, and by the way, uh, um, one I prefer it above all in its literal French version, which is which, which should be translated as signifying. Mm -hmm. See, it's a present participle or a gerund, and the reason I prefer it is because the present participle or the gerund seems to me to problematize in our everyday usage the the inability to stabilize. Uh, a now, in other words, uh, it's an ongoing, repetitive structure. The way it, that doesn't have its principle of closure within itself. It, it, it has to be interrupted, and that's, uh, in other words, um, when people are learning English, they will often confuse, let's say, the present participle with the present indicative. They'll say uh, singing instead of sing, or, and, and so on. And so, when you try to explain the difference, uh, if you think about it. The, the ing ending basically refers to a temporality of the enunciation. Now, you, you only can say I am thinking when you are 
doing that at the same time that you're saying it in some sense. There's a kind of a simultaneity that's, that's there. Whereas when you say, I sing, you have a generalized kind of presence that's independent of time. It's a now that's outside of time. And that's why uh, it's interesting in many of the thinkers and even poets like Hölderlin that I work on, I'll notice that the use of the ING or something corresponding to that comes at very, very interesting points. It's, it's always, and, and it's, also, um, it's also for that same reason that, for example, in the telling of jokes or uh, academic discourse will prefer to put it in the past uh, rather than to use a present that would be uh, uh, not distanced, not, not, not from which you couldn't, which would be uh, elusive. Uh, particularly when it's, uh, I, I mean, when I was a kid, there used to be a radio program called Duffy's Tavern. All of this stuff has been archived, by the way, on the internet. But it's it's, it's a mixed bag look for anybody who grew up with that, going back and listening, because you it, it sounds totally different when you hear it now than when you. This was like three times a week on the radio, and it was it would tell about these guys in an Irish bar who were basically telling jokes to each other and so on, and it would begin with a narrator saying. I'm sitting in the bar one evening when Duffy, you know, Duffy walks in and so on. This ING st stuck in my, I, didn't, I didn't, wasn't aware of it, but I was aware that it was part of an atmosphere, you know, of a participatory kind of uh, ongoing, uh, definitely, you know, sort of a working class atmosphere, uh, you know. Because polite people in English wouldn't say, I'm sitting there when so and so walks in. Say, I was, you might say, I was sitting or something there, and this happened. But you say, I am sitting and walk, and so on, making the present participle. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, uh, I also find this to be very interesting in connection with theatricality, where we, I mentioned that, the acting, acting as opposed to action. Uh, acting president or acting as a, a theatrical. You know, ah, he's only acting. It's very, you yeah, the ambiguity of, the, of the, 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 the act there not being present, present to itself. Um, yeah, so uh, I say interrupt at any time if you have remarks on, on any of this. So to go back to this, and he, he uh, then um, this 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 is really a crucial a crucial formulation that we get here. Um, that uh, then, inasmuch as it's essential and structural, this possibility is always at work, marking all the facts, all the events, even those which appear to disguise it. Just as iterability, which is not iteration, can be recognized even in a mark, when in fact, which in fact seems to have occurred only once. I say seems because this one time is in itself divided or multiplied in advance by its structure of repeatability. See that, that, that really now, if that's true, if that is arguable, if that in any way compelling, it means that our normal thinking which conceives of reality on the basis of what we call representations is, is inadequate. Because we represent objects. It's different if you, if you think of perception in the way uh, that, that Ehrenzweig will describe it as a scanning uh, of seeing in between things and so on and relationships. But if you think of it, uh, uh, mostly we think of reality as being what we can place in front of us, uh, what we've seen, what's stable, and what exists in and of it Self and uh, um, if this one time is in itself divided or multiplied in advance by its structure of re repeatability, uh, then uh, uh, any instantiation of it has to be, in a way, read in terms of something that is not immediately apparent, uh, as opposed to being simply perceived as that which it seems to be. See? So it's a different way of revalorizing the status of the visible phenomenal world there. It doesn't, I don't think, point to a, a, a meta-phenomenal world, you know, a higher, it doesn't point to a higher set of ideas or, uh, and so on. It, it, it seems to me to, to include temporality as change in the structure of reality. You see, it's not, so, it, it, it's also a different notion of movement. Movement traditionally, in terms of traditional, let's say, metaphysical thing, is a movement between one fixed place to another fixed place. Uh, Heidegger, in Being in Time, calls it locomotion, because the, the place is stable. 
So you go from point A to, to point B. Uh, if this is true, this, then the movement is already going on in the place itself. Is that we're going to come back to that in whatever you identify as a place, and that its its apparent stability is a, a construct, is an interpretation covering up a kind of incipient movement in it. You see, and uh, this is one reason I'll talk about this a little bit this afternoon. Why I, I take music and sound to be very powerful in this context, because sound is a medium which is intrinsically temporal. See, uh, I mean, I think that's true, according to this, that's true of all media. But when you look at one of the things we'll, we'll, we'll see, uh, if, I, if we can find the scene in the film I want to talk about, is a contrast between still life and, 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 and uh, of the time, the 16th century, and, uh, and music which is temporal, although repetitive, uh, in, in a certain sense. And uh, it's very interesting there that, in other words, music can't be made static, uh, because its mode of existence is temporal, as far as I can see, yeah. Uh, you, you know uh, Walter J. Young, about morality and literature? Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. and he goes on about that for a while, where he describes sort of, um, both in like oral cultures and in this case music, um, the fact that sound is an evanescent Sort of thing, exactly. right? as, as it's coming into reality, it is also coming out of reality. It cannot remain right. in the same way that a text can. So, and if you look at oral cultures, a lot of times they will see anything which has this property of evanescence to be um, magical, right? Because it only occurs mm -hmm. once. It can only right. occur once, and then it's gone. Yeah. But I mean, according to this argument, it, it can't even occur once. Mm -hmm. It can only occur twice, mm -hmm. which is interesting. So you get a contrast between, uh, in, other, in other words. Your your perception of the me if it implies movement, it has to uh, uh, occur minimum twice. Right. Yeah. yeah. So that's it. In other words, you have uh, there's, you can't reduce music to a point. If by a point you mean an element, a thing that is absolutely self-identical. There. See. But the problem is, this is the way we think of movement. Uh, we, I mean, generally, we think of movement as being. In other words, movement corresponds to this this scheme that we've been discussing to, let's say, difference as opposed to the opposition. It's something that, that comes after. Movement is, you have something that's static that then moves. See, that's the way we, you think. You don't, uh, and this is, I think, is somebody was talking before about quantum uh, physics and so on, yeah. You know, uh, whereas here you get movement is what creates. It, 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 movement is what is, 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 is the medium in which things then can be extrapolated, but they are, they're, they're not, it's not the movement of something to something else, if you see what I mean. And that's what's very interesting in, uh, so that in that sense, you know, see, music uh, uh, can, 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 can articulate that in a certain way in more immediately. And sound, in general, not just music, because music is a form of sound, but not all sound is music, uh, in, in a way that other media, that other media uh, can't. You see, uh, for example, the voice, it depends how the voice is used, but if the voice is recognizable as uh, the voice of someone or the voice saying something, then again, its movement is subordinate to what we, to we uh, interpret as being stable, as being already self-identical. And the, what's, what's it, with music, that's, very, that's much harder to do, you know, because music does not is not objective in that sense, and it doesn't can't be tied uh, so easily to meaning. So in movement where, and that's why, I mean, one of the things movement involves, I think, is a different relation to the body uh, in that sense, to movement is uh, sound in general, and then uh, involves a different bodily experience, let's say, than if you look at a, a normally, if you look at a painting, I think it depends how you, how you want to look at paintings, photographs, and so on. But again, the argument here, that's one of the reasons he uses Mark, is to try to get away from the idea that he's talking only about language, Directly not. He's talking about any process of, uh, of articulation. So that really involves any process where you're discriminating, recognizing, perceiving, uh, responding to it. It can be sound, it can be discursive sound, it can be noise, it can be music, it can be speech, it can be visual, it can be touch. Uh, in any, uh, they're all they're different. He didn't, certainly not, he says at the end, he says in this essay, I didn't reproduce it, I don't think, that the, it would be important to distinguish between different types of iterable marks. They aren't all the same. But they are all the same insofar as they question the, val the value of sameness as being self-same. 
as being able to be something once and, and for all, as it were. Which is an expression that he comes back to much later and, and, and tries to comp Derrida in a much later text and tries to complicate, you know, uh, tout, once and for all, and so on. That's also something we can talk about in relation to this film uh, 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 this afternoon. So here's where we get this idea of, of a kind of irreducible divisibility, but it's a, um, it's a divisibility which doesn't just take something and split it in half, it's like two symmetrical halves. It, it, dislocates, it dislocates what it also allows you to recognize and identify and leave something else that is not yet identified. Extra, and that—that's what—that's uh, uh, what he calls the remainder or the what's left over. He used the word very hard to translate in, in French, uh, restance. Uh, rest is remains or something, uh, sort of a remaining, something that that, that is is is, is uh, uh, that is in, is implied by this this split. So it isn't just a static. You know, you think you have one thing, but in fact you have two, like two halves. It's instead. You have something that isn't what it seems and then points to something that's else. So it's a much more dynamic, I think, um, a, a sort of a dynamic process there. Um, yeah, on the next page there, he's talking about the shopping list. Uh, and he comes, he, he makes some remarks about the eye that, that I think are relevant to what we've been talking about. Then at the very moment, at the very moment, the Tao side is about 10, pit, 10 lines down, and it's 49. At the very moment that I make a shopping list, I know, and so I use knowing here as a convenient term to designate the relations that I necessarily entertain with the object being constructed. I know that I will, that it will only be a list if it implies my absence. If it already detaches itself from me, potentially, you have to say, stuck in order to function beyond my present act. And if it's utilizable another time in the absence of my being present now, even if this absence is a simple absence of memory that the list is meant to make up for, shortly, in a moment, but one which is already the following moment. In other words, the moment is, through this idea of, 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 of uh, iterability, it already implies that it itself is already following itself in some sense. It's not, it's already split off from itself. This is really the most difficult and the, I think one of the most fundamental moves that, that, that he's making. To learning to see things as split off from themselves and implying a movement somewhere else. You see. That requires an active participation. And, and that's something that, although it's a buzzword, is why you know, I'd be tempted to say, to, to use the notion of reading or legibility as rather than perceiving, even if we're talking about visual or, 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 or sign, not as a sense of, of, of reading a meaning, but of realizing that whatever, you, whatever appears to you points also somewhere else, is, is, is both itself and something, something different in the same moment. Uh, uh, when we get to the Nietzsche, the Zaratustra part, I, I want to also show that I think Nietzsche is also you know, very much aware of that, and what he calls the Augenblick, the the, the instant, or the or or, or the uh, moment there. And he said, so he says, in a moment, but one which is already the following moment, in the absence of the now of writing of the writer, maintaining, grasping, and note the note the 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 present participle here, mm -hmm. the writer maintaining, grasping with one hand his ballpoint pen. Now it's very interesting that in French, the word for now is the, the word maintaining, literally. It's quite amazing, actually. You, know, you sort of wonder who cooked up these, these words, you know, because I mean, it's not obvious. It's like hand-holding for now. It's also another, another you know, uh, uh, maintaining or hand-holding, man to know. You know, that that would come to me. For me, ordinary language, you see, in this way, when nobody decides, particularly in English, where there's no academy français, anglaise, to tell, you know, what, what words are allowed and what words aren't allowed, uh, things come to be spontaneously, but as a Freudian, to some extent at least, I believe that there are always, you know, uh, generally very powerful constraints 
that are producing what appears from conscious, deliberate action to be spontaneous. So again, you know, it'd be interesting to look in the OED uh, as, <laughs> you know, where, so the etymology of, but I mean, I, I don't think you will get that far with it because they're probably, you know, maintaining or in French, man, well, we need the French dictionary, uh, maintenant. How does maintaining, maintenant, come to designate what we call now and what the French also understand as now, you see? Uh, if not, Again, my suspicion would be, at some level, there is an unconscious awareness that the now is not a point, but that it's a process. And not only is it a process, but it's a process which relates to the hand and to holding. The now is what enables you to take time and arrest it, to give you the sense of arresting it so that you think you, can, you have something to hold on to. You see? And that's... Uh, uh, what the, 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 at the same time that the word itself, if you take it literally, shows that, that the arresting will always be provisional. And you know, there's a, uh, excuse, another, another uh, off the wall uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, point here. Um, one of the things that strikes you again when you go back and forth in the US to, and Europe is the, the difference attached to the notion of maintenance. Mm. Like with our roads. The uh, road system. I mean, in Chicago, the bridges have to be rusted practically to falling through before they're then painted over, not not scraped, but painted over white so you don't see it. <laughs> and then at some time in the New York, you know, throughway system, the bridge collapses. I was just going to say, it like Minneapolis, they fall down. Minneapolis, they fall down. But it's still, in point of cost effectiveness, which is the main thing, you know, it doesn't matter. It's much more expensive to repair all the bridges than to you know worry about a couple of you know hundred people dying at some point when a bridge collapses on the in Minneapolis or in, you know over there's a, and and so on. Uh, but there's also an attitude there. There's an attitude about time and about reality. And uh, uh, in in Europe, there's much more of a tendency, it is my experience, to include cost of maintenance in whatever the ordinary costs are. Where it seems like in the US, that's sort of put off until the thing is ready to fall. Yeah, then you start worrying about it. So, you know, turns out we have, I don't know how many billions of dollars to, to uh, but you see, if you have a sense of reality <coughs> as being consisted, not of individual nows, bridges, but of their temporal existence as a repetitive process of wearing out, and being therefore constantly maintained, you'll have a different, you know, attitude toward reality than uh, you will if you think only in terms of individual, you know, bottom lines. Let's say, you know, because the bottom line of a of a double bookkeeping ledger, profit and loss, you know, emphasizes the result, but not the process. Mm 